Hi everybody, I'm Scarlett, I'm a cellist from the Netherlands and um, tonight we're listening, well tonight in Amsterdam, we're listening to Rick Mooney on his book Thump Position Book 2. Hi Rick. Hello. Um, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here and to see you all again and to have this opportunity to tell you about the book and what I was thinking about when I made it and where how, how to approach it perhaps in a way that will be useful to you all. Um, thank you again to Scarlett. Uh, she, she has made it so so nice for me to have an opportunity to tell people and share and to record and to put it on video and to put it on the internet so that it is something that is now out there for 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 people to refer to in the future and and charlotte's the one that has made that happen because the way my life is going at this moment i would probably never do this myself so you know this is a great service to all of us um um the, the little business again let me i did this at the last time uh, one little bit of business uh, uh scarlet and i were discussing this before you, uh, everybody showed up our next session is on november 23 okay 23 november It'll be at the same time. And the, the, the initial purpose of that was to discuss Boeing. Um, I have spent most of the sessions that I've talked to you all about with left hand. Um, and there's reasons for that. But as I mentioned at our last session, the real music is made in the bow. And so to have one session, at least talking about bow strokes, uh, uh, turned out to be pretty pretty important to me. So we're going to do that next time. There are other topics and other things, and I will mention at least one of them today, um, uh, that we may even have some more. But right now, that one, two weeks from today, is the last scheduled one. But you, you're, you're all on the mailing list. You'll get notification. Um, uh, let me just take a minute to talk about something completely different. Um, Scarlett mentioned that some people were having trouble understanding the harmonics that I use way back in Position Pieces Book One, um, and 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 having trouble finding them and understanding how they're supposed to work. If I could take five minutes to just talk about this thing, and I may bring it up again in another session. Um, and hopefully help you out a bit. Now, the harmonics, it's all math, okay? This is the other thing that you may not know about me, and I'm gonna, I was thinking about this before the session began. Uh, this is not a secret, but it doesn't come up a lot. I actually don't have a music degree. I have a math degree. And the story is very, very long. Uh, but the bottom line of the story is when I was a freshman at university, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and unqualified. And I was advised to seek something else with my life. And so I went into math because I was interested in computer science. And, um, 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 but that's the way my mind thinks, right? I tell people nowadays that I couldn't solve a calculus problem today to save my life because I don't remember all the rules. But you know what math does for you? It makes you learn how to think. It makes you learn how to put one step in front of the other and come to a conclusion at the end. And you might actually, having me just say that, you might see that in, the, in all these books, right? It's because if nothing else, they're very logical. Now, so, and it turned out, of course, obviously, I kept up with my cello and I took lessons from Eleanor Schoenfeld, who kind of saved my cello life at that time. And here I am, here I am doing the cello and not doing math. Um, but when I did my physics paper, for instance, in university, you know what I did it on? I did it on tuning. I did it on tuning an instrument and the, the, and the, the temperament and the Pythagorean comma. 
and all that stuff that's going on, you know? And the fact is that the proportions of a vibrating column of air or a vibrating string is also very mathematical and goes way back to the ancient Greeks. Pythagoras had it all down. So let me just very quickly run this to by you. And, and, and if there's any questions, we'll do it. And as I said, maybe, maybe at another session, I can talk about it again. But first of all, understand that when you cut the string, well, first of all, let me tell you this. What happens with a harmonic is you press lightly in the mathematical spot. And what it does is it creates a node on the string. The string then begins to vibrate in like a figure eight pattern around that node. And that's what creates the overtone. And so this halfway up the string provides us with an overtone that is exactly one octave above the open string, the fundamental note. If we further cut the string into fourths, we now get a pitch that is two octaves above the fundamental. And so this is a fourth here, and it's here as well. The very same pitch, one fourth, cutting the string into fourths. If we cut the string into thirds, we get an octave and a fifth above the fundamental. So if this is a D, here is an A, and here is an A. Again, the proportion, and it matters not whether you hit it here or hit it there, it's the same. The thing that I like about the harmonics in terms of the function of my books is that the harmonic will be in tune. One little proviso, if I remember, I'll say it in a minute. They will be in tune if the string is in tune. And my goal, as you know very well by now, is that my students should get home and be able to play things correctly and know that they're correct when they practice. Therefore, having something a given to match against turns out to be fairly important to me, okay? So this is a third. Now, then it gets a little funny. If you divide the string into fifths, you get an octave and a third. Okay, so this is an F sharp. There it is, F sharp, sorry. And it's here, B. Okay, I'm having trouble finding that. I should have done this practices just before I showed you. But this note is here. I'm sorry, it's here. I can't find that pitch right now. There it is. There it is. There it is. And here too. Oh, here too. This way. There it is. Where the thumb goes. This is F sharp. This F sharp. This F sharp. This F sharp. There. That one's mean. That one's hard to hit. You don't put your finger in exactly the right spot, obviously. You don't get anything. But that's why I use it in like bugle call and the toy soldiers, okay? Because you really have to put your finger in exactly the right place. There are more harmonics, they are less friendly. I believe there's actually a G harmonic on the A string, which is like cutting the string in sevenths or something. And I, I don't go there. Um, but, but I do think that this fundamental halfway up, quarter, three quarters of the way up, one quarter, cutting the string into quarters, cutting the strings into thirds. And then this one, they can all be quite useful. And as I said, it's all a very mathematic thing. You can bring out your ruler and measure, and it, would, it will tell you where those are. So if people are having trouble finding those harmonics, uh, by the way, let me say one final thing about this. And one of the reasons I put them in the book is I was never told this when I was a student. This notation with the, with the, with the diamond heads on the note heads, um, no one ever told me what that meant. What is that? That's actually called tablet, 
tabulature. They do that a lot with guitar fingerboards. And the point of tablature is they're not trying to show you the pitch. They're trying to show you the spot on the fingerboard where you put your finger. And, and that's what happens with these note hits is that, is that it's not telling you the pitch you're going to get. It's telling you, you put your finger in the place where that note would normally be where you playing firmly and you play the harmonic that lives in that very same spot. And it may very well be a different pitch. So be ready for that. But it's the tablature. It, it, otherwise, your ledger lines. Otherwise, you know, that F sharp's way, 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 way up here and nobody can read it. It's easier to mark the spot on the fingerboard. So if I may just say one final time that these issues are issues that I was never taught when I was young. And therefore, I've tried to incorporate them in the books. And if people are having trouble finding the harmonics, I hope that's helpful. You know, just use the math. Okay. All right, so let us get into Thumb Position Book 2. As I explained last time, this is going to be uh, a little bit less participatory than some of the sessions we have had. Um, uh, uh, it, I also acknowledge one more time, there may be people who are not teachers, even though I will be expressing myself as a teacher would approach this with a student. Um, it, it should be informative nonetheless to the people who are not actually teachers. If you are learning how to do this on your own, I'm hoping that this discussion will be helpful. Further, especially with this book, there's some really hard stuff in here. And you may not, you may not be able to do it today, but that's fine. You know, who cares? Um, that's why we're putting that on video is that we're going to get it down. You can refer to it. And as you yourself advance, you can refer back and, and you know, once again, get some of the details that I'm after here. Uh, but yeah, it's a really challenging book. All right. So here we go. Way back. I mentioned this once. I'm going to bring it up here again. When I was young, um, I, I took, uh, what, well, let me put it this way. I'll say it quite backwards. When I started talking about my books, when they were first out and people wanted me to talk, um, I, I developed a, 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 a lecture and the lecture was called Sink or Swim. And the reason I called it that is because that was my method. The method that was given to me when I was young was Sink or Swim. You get thrown in the deep end and you either learn to swim or you don't. And if you don't, they say, well, fine, why don't you just take some take math instead of music, right? Right. And 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 because you know, and those who could learn to swim very quickly, well, suddenly they're called talented, right? And they would continue on. And and it was just so totally unfair to be given. I still have a date on Popper like 13 with all the octaves and stuff. There was no way I can't play that one today let alone back when I was in high school. And that's yet what we were all given. And we get thrown right into the deep end of the pool. And so I fi have figured the way that the, the continue the metaphor that what I have done with my books is I put the shallow end on the pool and you can step in with your toes and you can go step by step, bit by bit out there to the deep end. And once you get there, well, you already know how to swim. You can be out there with big guys and, and works. And, and here's what happens. When I get done with the sequence, position pieces one, position pieces two, double stops is in there. It's not quite in the same order. Uh, thumb position one, thumb position two. Then I jump right into the Bobber High School of Playing, the high school etudes, and it works. I hoped that it would when I did all this and I was amazingly gratified to find out when I actually put it in practice that it worked. Not only did my students find themselves able to play those poppers, but they loved them. I had a guy who said, oh, can I do another one? You know, and that was so far from my own experience with those atives. So that's the thing, right? This is the bridge between our fundamental 
home base, foundation, thumb position, finger pattern, and into the poppers. So this is like got a lot of stuff in it to get us there. Um, um, but, but it works. It works. So let me, I think I've said everything I wanted to say about this. As, oh, one final preliminary topic. Let me just remind you, please, that when, when, when Scarlett and I were talking about talking about this book, I decided I couldn't do it in one session. I needed to do it in three. And so if you will think about all the things we have done up until this point to prepare us for this moment, all the way back to the book 10 posture, all the way back to using your weight and to balancing and, uh, and having flexibility and softness and movability um, so, so that these things that we're being asked to do will actually be possible. It depends upon the setup. If you dive right into this, well, then it's just as bad as the sink or swim method. If you go through the shallow end, it works, okay? So don't, don't forget to refer back to some of that stuff we did because playing up here and playing the things I'm going to be asking you to play is going to depend upon that ease and that flexibility and that balance and not squeezing and that weirdness, which we discussed in our last session. All right, so let's just take a look. Again, we're gonna kind of thumb through this a little quickly. I'm going to show you what's going on. I'm going to demonstrate a little bit. I'm going to, I don't have time to, to play lots, but if I can at least lead you through the sequence, then you can expand upon it as you explore the book on your own. Group one warmups. As with all the other books, you ask me the, 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 Pertinent information is in the warm-ups. The pieces are designed to be a pleasant way to apply that knowledge, but the warm-ups give you what you need to do. Group one warm-up is mainly about chromatic pattern. Now, the chromatic pattern is one, and I think I must have mentioned this in the position pieces book two, because I sneak the chromatic pattern in periodically. My idea being that it's not so weird and it's not so hard, it's not enigmatic, you know, and, 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 and it, you just have to see it and recognize it. And then you put your fingers all in half steps, all in semitones, and that's it. I didn't feel it necessary to create an entire chapter on the chromatic pattern. Uh, keep in mind, for instance, there's only one chromatic scale, right? There's only one. <laughs> That's every note that you have, every semitone on the instrument. At least we're talking Western scale now, you know, and 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 you just start on whatever note it is in the context of the music you're doing, but it's the same. Mostly that one open one two three one two three open one two three one two three is the basic chromatic scale pattern. We will, in real passages, use four, and I'm going to be doing that here, too. When you're not continuing, but staying within a pattern, one, two, three, four, in, in a chromatic pattern. All right, there are some other ones here, and I'll get to them when I get to them. Very, very beginning, then. Pattern one. I mean, number one warm-up in group one. Chromatic pattern. First, again, notice I built in the target practice with the G to make sure they got in tune. Second, already one other issue shows up. This is what I call an extension in thumb position. Down here, extension has this special meaning, and it's fine. It's cool. I do it all the time. But up here, we're not doing that with our fingers. But extension to me in thumb position is when you're going to leave your thumb in its spot as your anchor, you're going to move your hand away and then bring it right back. Now, if I'm going to go away and stay, well, then my whole hand will slide and I'll have an entire fingering pattern and we'll play up here for a while. But if I'm going to go up and come back, I leave my thumb behind. 
And I call that an extension. You see when I put my second finger on that G target spot here? Well, that's an extension of the hand. So that's our extension in thumb position. Number two does introduce the fourth finger. I'm gonna be talking about fourth finger more in the next section. Uh, this fourth finger is just a semitone, just a half step. So it's not a huge deal. So let me save the rest of my fourth finger conversation for, for the next bit. But uh, one of the things I wanna point out about this and it's through the entire book, and I said this before, I will say it again, please ask your students to read the introduction because there's lots of little bits of information that will assist them as they play the book. In other words, there are two sets of slurs here. There's a specific reason for that. It's explained in the introduction. I want students to start slowly and get it in tune and therefore use the inner slurs where there are fewer notes in the bow. And then as you begin to get comfortable, velocity does become an important issue. One has to be able to play quickly and therefore use the outer slur with more notes in the bow at a faster tempo when it becomes more familiar to you, okay? So I may not be doing the outer slurs much. I'm not gonna try and demonstrate facility to you all, but that's why there's two sets there. Uh, um, this again, number four, number two warm up is this chromatic thing. <laughs> same patterns then on the A string. Number three is a, it's a thing my students may actually have done before, before we get to this book. So this is not necessarily a new thing for them, but it's an appropriate moment to talk about this. There is another interval. I mean, did I ever, I, maybe I never told you guys this. Um, I was sending this book out. I was sending this book out to some of my colleagues to help them, you know, I asked them to give it a test drive and give me feedback uh, before I got it uh, published. And one of my friends who is a little bit um, um, OCD like I am, just sort of all things in a row, um, said, you know, there's actually eight patterns in thumb position. And my first reaction was, oh my goodness, I just spent a whole book on four patterns and I don't even want to think about eight, right? And then she said, oh, but you know, you actually get to them all in this book. And that made me feel much better. The only difference is I haven't tried to label them all. Right. Remember what I said to you before. I made conscious decisions not to try to be 100% exhaustive of all possibilities in the universe that are that one can do. What I want to do is present a system, and I present the system with sort of the most commonly seen um, um, items when you get them into real repertoire with the idea that when you get into a chromatic pattern or this next one I'm gonna mention in just a second, all you gotta do is know the name of the note, know the distance between them and deal with the finger pattern. And you have a target, name a note, distance, finger pattern. This is the system. And I don't need to write an entire section of a book on an augmented second, right? Because all you gotta do is name the notes and figure it out. But that's what this is. This is Popper Gavat. Sorry, here it is. Okay, this is it. There's our augmented sec second right there, where the thumb moves up to the to the um, E sharp. Um. I'm going to say this now while I'm thinking of it. There are throughout this book uh, what I refer to as Easter eggs, and that's a computer, a, a computer programming term, me being the math geek 
Now, I don't know if geek and nerd resonates with people who don't speak English. It's very colloquial and very slang. Uh, but um, geek and nerd is sometimes considered an insult, but those of us who are gain some pride about being a geek and a nerd um, um, because you know what? It works. It just works. And, and so uh, the Easter egg is a computer programming term because there are some computer programs that if you punch the correct keystrokes, you get a little display. They build it in to the programming. You're gonna find in here some Easter eggs and I will point them out when they show up. Popper Gabot being one of them, frankly, okay? This one's Tchaikovsky. And there's our chromatic second again. I mean, augmented second. Okay. We go from this one, which would normally be a pattern one, and this one, which would normally be a pattern three, and it's a bigger space. Not that it's amazingly hard, but you, you got to yeah, recognize it. All right. Five and six turn out to be very, very, very important to me. These are one. Uh, these are an example of one of the ways why I think this book works as a preparation for the Popper High School. Because Popper's harmonic language is really complex. My friend, um, Kerry Cheney, uh, has, a, has, a, has an explanation about this, which I tend to believe. I haven't done a lot of research, but it makes total sense to me. Popper found himself in the opera orchestra. He's doing Wagner. He's doing, um, you know, he, he's doing Richard Strauss. And he's realizing, you know, what? nobody ever taught me how to do this stuff. And so he wrote the Popper Etudes with all that chromaticism and all the complexity that's showing up in this, this music that's coming out in the world, the brand new stuff that no one had ever seen or heard of before. And so, and so this one, the hard thing about five and six, it's basically the same thing. One of them's on the D string, one of them's on the A. It doesn't sound like anything. Now, you know, that's quite a departure from what I have done with much of my work in the past here, which is I actually want them to sound like something so that the students can recognize and make sure it's right. But then there comes a time when you can't, you know, you're trying to figure out Don Juan. <laughs> it doesn't sound like anything, right? And you just have to go through the system. So this is... I'm going to go four. In one finger modes. And there is our pattern two, in coincidentally. So on, you say it's 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 a sequence. One could learn it kind of by rote, just by patterns. I always ask the students to know the names of the notes because we need to refer from this to the future. But the point being that that it's it's one finger moves at a time, and you gradually go up. And if you know the names of the notes, you know the distances, and you can figure it out. And these ones, these ones, right at the beginning of the book, turn out to be pretty challenging for my students. Um, but there's the rationale, there's the reasoning. We get some pieces. This nice little wooden soldiers for, by Tchaikovsky. Well, there's our proper gavotte right away. With the E sharp. supposed to play softer. My tone uh, on, the, on the microphone overloads it, so I apologize. I'm going to try and remember. Here comes chromatic pattern. OK. 
Okay. So in this nice piece, we get a chance for our popper gavotte open hand. We get a chance for the chromatic. And, and it, it's a nice piece to have right here. Um, then we get to the gypsy campfire. And in the gypsy campfire, this is a terrible ripoff of a violin piece over here in the, in the last page. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, so there's that gypsy thing. But over here, starting at bar nine, These things that are in the warm up show up in the pieces. Finally, Harry the Hearsuit Housefly. This is a joke. If English is not your first language, Hearsuit means Harry. Okay, Harry. And so this is Harry the Harry Housefly. That's, that's the pun. Okay, uh, Harry being the name and Harry being the description. I wrote it this way. You know me by now. You know that I got this very strange sense of humor. It's just because I'm a geek, right? <laughs> um, the, um, somebody already wrote a bumblebee, right? So I'm going to have to do something else. And here it is. <laughs> The small extension here, the chromatic pattern all over the place. And that's, that's the way the thing goes. There's this is swatting the fly in, in, in the, uh, the teacher's part in bar 24, where they're going, this is, this is what we're doing here. And over here is, hmm. swatting the fly. And there's one final little joke in the teacher's part in measure 33. I couldn't resist putting in everybody's most hated cello blind in the Pachelbel Canon. Okay, there it is. Makes me laugh. I'm sorry. I have a composer friend who writes stuff, and he his wife tells stories about the giggles coming out of his studio in the middle of the night as he's doing things. You know. Okay. Now we're going to look at group two. Now group two is really going to talk about the extension of the hand. Okay, moving up here with this part of our hand. Um, um, so it, um, the number one and number two, they're about playing the same notes and you have three different options of how to do it. Now, using fourth finger is controversial. A little. I had one friend who told me, you know, the only reason that we don't do fourth finger more in thumb position is no one gets good enough at it to be comfortable. If you get good at it, you use it all the time. Ask me, that's truth. I couldn't do Bach re A major sonata without the fourth finger. You know, you just have to. I have another friend who says, you know, I actually, and she's a very accomplished cellist. I cannot use my fourth finger. And the reason is her hand is built this way. And it's built to the point where the little finger itself is not short, but it joins the rest of her fingers at a funny angle. And it, in fact, becomes de facto my fourth finger's too short. 
And, and, and she really says, I can't use fourth finger and thumb position. In deference to that, when I present the pieces which follow, I have given two sets of fingerings. One set of fingering to use the fourth finger. Now a whole tone, right? We did fourth finger back here with semitones. I, I, I don't think that's a problem. Talking about fourth finger with a whole tone, maybe an issue. Um, so I have presented a fourth finger fingering with the whole tones. I have also prevented it, uh, presented an alternate fingering with the extension of the hand using a third finger. I ask all of my students when this occurs, I ask them, please always try the fourth finger one first. Because if you are able to use four, I want you to use four. I want you to get comfortable with it. Uh, if you simply cannot do four, fine. Well, then do the other. Um, but, but that's my goal in this, is to deal with a fourth finger for people whose hands allow them to do that. So all of these warm-ups are very much like that. Number four, we can just take a quick look. They're, they're somewhat repetitive. Alternate. Okay, so that's what this is about. Now, let me rush through. I'm already talking too much. I'm getting too long, and I really don't want to keep us uh, too long. Um, there are two Easter eggs in here. One is at, a, at, at the behest of one of my colleagues. I don't teach this piece. This is the Dance of the Elves or something by Popper, okay? And, and it, has this, it has this moving your hand away and extending. So that's cool. Here's the one I used. This is the one I really love. Number 11. Sorry, big time Easter egg here. Sorry, I got my finger pattern wrong. So it's this is our Bacharini concerto, yes. And if you learn this, which I call the skeleton, which is the fingering pattern absent all the bowings and the rhythms and stuff. Well, when you get to that Bacharini Concerto, you've got one of the hardest places in the entire first piece, first movement already learned, okay? Um, and that was another one of my colleagues' requests. She said, you know, I bet by the time you're done with this book, you're gonna have every, everybody's, the, all the hardest places in all the concertos in there as a warm up somewhere. And not that I made a huge monster plan about it, but it in fact occurred that there are lots of things in here where the hardest stuff is presented here in its basic skeleton form so that when you find it in real piece, it, you can do it. Uh, the drummers then, in the drummers, take a look and measure eight, example of what I explained. My preference is to play three and four, but here's the alternate. They both work. Thank you. I mean, honestly, I'm not trying to say you, everyone has to do this. If there are lots of reasons, if there are reasons why you don't want to, well, fine, there's an alternative. And I've tried to give that. But to repeat what I said earlier, I want my students to experiment with the fourth finger first, with the idea that they become more and more comfortable. Um, petite partita is a, 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 a total ripoff. You'll recognize this. I'm skipping a little now. Okay. And it, it, you know, 
it's it's fun to play. It's a joke. It's a joke, but it's fun to play. My my composer friend that I mentioned recently, I performed this uh, on faculty concert at National Cello Institute some years ago, and he was laughing in the back. He said, "I went back." He said, "The the 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 um oh God, what do we call it when we go from one key to another? The ah." I've just lost that word. Uh, in the, the modulation, the modulation police are going to come and put you in jail. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just supposed to be fun. But you see the point, right? And here it is. And we're going to need this. We're going to need this in the future. And we have a nice opportunity and a fun piece to play. Um, to, 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 to help us get there. All of these classic sort of cliche. With all of this, okay? Needing to move. Group three warm ups is about how to take your thumb over to the G string. Keep in mind that until this point, we have had our thumb basically planted on the harmonic spots on DNA. And there are times when you gotta move your thumb. Uh, um, I believe this is Richard Slavich. I have mentioned him before because he wrote an article which I keep, which I refer to about the popper etudes and about the, uh, 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 um, the application. And what he says is something that I did already, but he said it so well, and I give him credit for the words, that when you move your thumb, you need to temporarily have a finger, a finger to temporarily hold the balance of your hand, releasing the thumb so that it can move and then become your anchor again. The idea is, again, students, kids will kind of let their thumb kind of scoot randomly across the strings. I don't want them to let their thumb scoot randomly across their strings. I tell them, I want you to learn to move your thumb with the same kind of precision that you learn that you use with any other finger. Therefore, in these warm ups, I have asked, I put a little asterisks on them. And in that place, in the asterisk, is the place where at that moment, some other fingers down, allowing you then to release your thumb and move it at that point in time. Again, with precision, I'm overdoing the size of this, you know, I don't let my students pound their thumb that way. But but just so people can see what I'm talking about, while I'm holding my balance, my thumb moves around. Now this has some particular benefit, like in number three. Sorry. Well, this is third movement of Heide Concerto, yes? As is this. This is third movement of Haydn Concerto. Uh, the number five is the first movement of Haydn Concerto. I don't happen to teach this fingering. I don't like this fingering, but there are a lot of people that teach it without getting into an argument. I, I don't, it's not important, right? Because it works. But this is the, uh, and a one of the choices for fingerings in this particular passage. <laughs> You've got to start with the thumb over here and it's got to move over there. Uh, let me simply repeat, because this is not a big, big, big section in this book, but the one issue is, please be sure that the, the one other finger is down, holding the balance in the spot of your hand, allowing your thumb to move, allowing your thumb to move uh, um, precisely, okay? Then the pieces do that. Now in the pieces, 
This is a very common sailor's hornpipe. I hope people recognize this. Okay. The, the thing being that I did not put asterisks in this one. When you think about it, one could choose to move their thumb across at any number of places in the passage. All I ask of my students is you find one. You find a spot. You're going to put a finger down. You're going to move your thumb. And I don't care where. I didn't dictate it with an asterisk. But that's our, that's our job. That's our plan right now. That's the whole group three and the rollicking Irishman, very cool Irish, Irish jig. Again, thumb back and forth from over to the G string and back again. Group four is about taking your, thought, your hand in and out of thumb position. So here again, up until now, I've let, had the students pretty much planting their hand right here and stay in there. Well, now we're gonna talk about getting back and forth. And so, and again, some of my students have done these pieces before we get here, but this. Well, that's the Squire Tarantella. Well, I put a little wiggle on it to give them one more opportunity to move in and out but that's the Squire Tarantella. This is Popper Gavat. Where you've got to go. I'm sorry, I'm probably playing too loud again, but you get the point, yeah? The idea being that you've got to be able to know that place. Boom, target, thumb, solid, uh, secure, just as it would be with any other finger. Number four, I stole directly out of a very big, long arpeggio etude in the Kosman book. I don't use those etudes. Um, I don't, I, I call the Kosman book Tendonitis City. You know, all of these, you know, people that do it, especially when they do them wrong, it's, it's just gonna kill your hand. But, and I don't use the arpeggios in the in the Kosman book because when I do three octave arpeggios, I've got a universal pattern that works on all arpeggios. And with 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 his book, everything's a different fingering and it's too hard for me. <laughs> but this one, this one is a really, really good one. I gotta get the right key going here. Uh, Ask for the repeats. I'm going to skip them here today. And I played that badly. Man, you get it. You get D, you get G, you get D major, G major, D minor, um, the, the one and the four in the, in, in the, the one and the five in the arpeggio sequence. It's four. Really a very good etude and actually pretty hard for my students to be able to hit it back and forth, hit it reliably, hit it reliably, land with a finger pattern. So it's one of those that I pull out and say, you know, let's just do this like a month. Even after we move beyond, let's just keep doing this one. This is a really good A2. Now, we're starting to get then into some pieces. These pieces are frankly quite simple at this point in the book. It just happened that way. These are, again, pieces where we're going to be in and out of thumb position. It starts to underscore the issues that I have said before, 
that that there are going to be times we're not going to vibrato with our thumb, right? If we got a slow piece and we want to have vibrato on notes, we're going to shift instead. And so these Bach chorales. <laughs> We're going to go here. For another musical reason, those notes exist over here, but there are going to be times when we don't want to be crossing strings. We want the melody to be on the same string color. You know, so none of these pieces that I present here are terribly difficult, but they illustrate that point where there are going to be choices where we want to move in and out of thumb position rather than stay, rather than stay. All right, now, I'm really, really, really running out of time. I fear I'm gonna go over my hour, but rather than break it off and do part two later, let me see if I can really kind of go quickly through what happens next. Starting with group five, one of the most important big deal sections of this entire book. This is now where we're gonna start moving our thumb off the harmonic spot and play. Now, you remember way back in the book one, I said, I want my students to start pushing their thumb down. I, I don't wanna use that word push. I really don't like it. I want them to put their thumb heavily into the string with pronation and sinking. And in, bo in book one, I don't care if they only just get it halfway down to the fingerboard. Well, now we're going to have to not only get it down all the way down to the fingerboard, but we're going to have to bring our elbow up and make sure the thumb is down firmly on the D string as well. So this is where some of those warm-ups refer back, please, to the one finger scale session we had a couple of weeks ago, because I had some. <laughs> etudes in that that we're dealing with the thumb on all the steps of the scale number one in group five is a review of the finger patterns in our home base Number two, here's our target. Sorry, I have to do that myself. And number three. I use the target to help me find the spot on the fingerboard. Then I rely upon the fingering patterns um, to help me in that spot. Two things worth saying. Uh, one is that one of my colleagues specifically asked for this and I, I, I was able to easily introduce it into the book. She wanted more tenor clef in a uh, notation in thumb position so that the kids would get used to that. And so in this book, when I start on this place and move down this way, I notate it in tenor clef. If I start here and move up this way, I notate it in treble clef. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what that's about. Um, there was one more thing I was gonna say about it and I can't remember right now. Okay, so when we get to Moon Over the Ruined Castle, oh, 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 this is what I'm gonna say. Even though it's very, very easy to do these by rote because of the finger patterns, I really try to ask my students to know the names of the notes in each location when they shift. Because again, without the names, you don't recognize them. You can't take the knowledge you've learned in the past and apply it to the future. And so I want them to know their names. The moon over the ruined castle would be associated with number two warm up. And this is probably another thing that glanced through my mind as I was doing this. You don't have to do all those warm ups before you do the pieces. Um, number two is all you got to do before you hit moon over the ruined castle. When you do moon over the ruined castle, it is all 
of the notes are in this place with one on the target and thumb on the C. And the moon over the ruined castle is in this place and stays. Then the next piece, uh, Flora MacDonald, goes between the new place and the old home position place with the harmonic spot, back and forth and back and forth between the two places. Soldier's Joy then would be referring to second finger on our target and warm up number three on the previous page. And it will stay there for the entire piece. And then when you move on, um, I, I'm going to skip group six for now, okay? Uh, when you move on, then your thumb is going to move from one place to the next, from this B flat to this C to this D, back and forth a little bit. Um, same with unfortunate rake. Unfortunate, here, the unfortunate rake um, fills a gap, okay? Please remember again, I'm not trying to do every single spot on the fingerboard. It becomes unwieldy. It becomes impossible to use. So like what I did in the warm-ups is I put my second finger on the D and then I had a B flat. Well, you know what? There's a B natural in there too, right? Right? And that's the unfortunate rate. It puts you on the B natural, on the in-betweener notes. And again, the point is, it's not that big of a deal if you name the notes and if you got a target and if you got a finger pattern, you know, you just apply the system. May time is this one again now with our th third finger on the harmonic place and our thumb back here on E and A. Okay. And the Timmer the Tartar goes back and forth between this one and this one and this one and this one. The harmonic place and the new one with the thumb on the E and the A, back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Now, number seven then starts on E. <laughs> and so on. And then we get. Up, up by steps, okay? The same system applies. Mrs. McLeod has got my thumb on E and stays there. Devil Among the Tailor goes between the E and the home base spot, back and forth and back and forth, okay? Then it goes uh, to Endearing Young Charms and Yankee Doodle, the same. Endearing Young Charms has got my two on the A target here. That makes my thumb on the F over here, okay? A, G, F. And Yankee Doodle goes back and forth and back and forth. I really want to talk about warm-ups number eight. I don't have, I don't think I need to demonstrate, uh, but I do really want to make a point here. This is one of the times when I feel like I did not invent this, okay? This is a, a, a thing that teachers have done for a long, long time. Janos Starker, I heard him speak. He said one of the hardest things about playing a string instrument is the diminishing interval. The fact that, that it, it starts out here and it gets smaller and then it gets larger and every semitone, every half tone on the fingerboard, you have to understand the difference, the change in the spacing of the fingers. And so he takes in his book, The Organized Approach, he's got passages from Baccarini A Major Concerto, I think, and Beth, uh, no, Baccarini Concerto and maybe the Beethoven A Major Sonata, where he's got a running passage and he has them do it on every half step on the instrument. In order, to, in order to get that feeling. What a great idea, but my poor eight-year-olds, they can't play the Baccarini A major sonata. You know, they can't. How about French folk song? Let's do French folk song. Let's do French folk song on every half step on the instrument. So, 
I'm going to go kind of quick because I really am out of time. I'm going to apologize to you again before I'm done. never let my students go that fast okay the goal is to go slow and go go, go in tune i'm just trying to shave seconds off here and that goes all the way up to a up here and so we're going to do that thing, that thing which I did not invent, which is accepted as a, as a, a vitally important thing to learn to play a string instrument about how you've got to adjust the spacing every time you shift with a piece of repertoire that my students can actually handle and play into. And, and so that's the shallow end of the pool. Thank you. Okay. You know, just, just to bring that back up again. Um, so I'm moving now. Group ten warm ups. I'm simply. Oh, I can talk about group nine in just a second. Um, group ten warm ups. I'm not even going to do today with you because that that is a uh, uh, abbreviated version of the thumb scale that we talked about in our previous session. So, so uh, this is just what fit in the book, okay? The only thing that I thought that I needed to add, which saw a few people actually got confused, and I, it, you know, I kind of go, well, yeah, I should have thought about this ahead of time. I would have put a Roman numeral one underneath the first note of each of those, number one and number two, because people look at that D with a thumb and they think it's here. Okay, and know what the D with the thumb is supposed to be here. This is our one finger scale, okay? And the turn. We did that before, but that's what the intention is, to run up the same string and not be going across. Therefore, Roman numeral one to indicate A string. Group nine is about how do you hold your hand in place and move your thumb behind it, okay? And number nine, number one is Allegro Spiritoso by Sinalier. I am forgetting his first name. Oh, yeah. your fingers stay and hold your place and your thumb moves back and forth. Number two. And then your thumb moves. And I have the repeat to move it back and forth. concerto. That's the Haydn concerto. Number three, this one. Thumb. Thumb. This is Dvorak concerto. I can't play it anymore. I, I played it actually with an orchestra once, but I can't play it now. This this place in the Dvorak concerto where your thumb's got to move back and forth. This is the skeleton for that passage. Then we get to the spinning wheel, which is another little gag, okay? Spinning wheel is not a gag in and of itself. thumb moving around while the rest of the finger stays still. 
So I was, I was doing this with some of my friends. I tested this out on like everybody before I ever published it. And my guy goes, whoa, man, thumbs of steel. Hence the name of the book. There's a, there's a, there's a further gag here because the actress, um, I don't remember her name, uh, Jane Fonda had a series of exercise tapes that she called Buns of Steel. And so I just couldn't resist. This is me and my geeky humor, okay? The Thumbs of Steel. And, and this is where it all came from. The spinning wheel is where that started, okay? Now, from here on is basically the summarizing section of the book. From here on is uh, where all the stuff that we've talked about before, we can, we put together. Cajun waltz, the Cajuns are down in Louisiana. They're French Canadians that migrated there years and years and years ago. They have their own kind of music and then Cajun food and you get down to New Orleans and yeah, yeah, find out what Cajuns are like and it's really fun. And their folk music is just fantastic. It sounds kind of like this. <laughs> And, and, and so on. And it moves again, it moves, it has got an extension and it moves back and forth. It's got the, the summary of the things that we have done in here before. Oh, I got to show you these warm ups. <sighs> I'm getting so late. Group 11. First of all, arpeggio, got to play it in tune. Second of all, every semitone on the instrument. Two, adds the seventh into it. Add one more note in number three and you get. I'm in the wrong, no wonder I'm doing that. I'm having my problem. Sorry, guys. Baccarini Concerto. The one of the hardest places in the third movement of the Baccarini Concerto starts with a major arpeggio. Add the seventh put this one note in, you got it done. You build it up step by step. Caron's Quarrel, Dream of You, again, it's just getting you to play all over the instrument. Warm up number 12 is Baccarini Concerto. <laughs> Group 13, this is the fingering I use in the Haydn. Up rather than across. Um, this one. with a thumb scale. One might call this one pattern five. We've never really done it before. It's been in here, but it doesn't have a number, but semitone here and semitone here. Well, this is Sansons Concerto, yeah? I didn't, 
practiced it before I mean, the session, but this is the third movement of the Sassos Concerto with exactly that set of fingering patterns working from one place to the next. So here again, it's a little Easter egg. It's a little Easter egg that you get to deal with the skeleton and the hardest place. And then when you find it in the piece, it's like done. Uh, Thumb Callous Blues is for fun. Blue Ridge Ballad is arguably the hardest piece in the book, just because these intervals are so difficult to play. <laughs> But this is Baccarini Concerto all over the place again, right? Um, 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 this, this whole thing. It is, this second is exactly the same fingering pattern as this octave. It's just when you put it over there, it becomes a second. And yet it's hard to hear and it needs to be right in tune. So the Blue Ridge Ballad is really hard to play in tune. But then you get to the third moon of Baccarini and you're done. Now, I feel like I've kind of raced through the end of the book, but I do think that you can see the system. Yeah? You can see the organization. You can see how one thing leads to another. You can see how it how it applies out into the future and out into other 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 repertoire. One of the things that uh, Scarlett and I talked about is now after this, I'd send my students to Popper High School. I have things to say about how to teach the Popper High School. Um, in other words, you, you, you don't start at number one and go on through. You just don't. He didn't write them in an order. He didn't put them in an order, a pedagogical order. I think he just put them down the way he wrote them. But number four is like one of the hardest ones in the entire book. And number 36 is one of the most friendly. So I have uh, uh, some things to say about this. And if people are interested in talking about and maybe an order, a way to present some of the pop poppers to your students, maybe a few fingering ideas that might bring it more into the modern era um, than, than some of the things that are already there, um, that could be another session. I've done this session before. I, do, I, I, I don't know where to find it. Um, or else I'd refer you to it. But we can do that in this, in this forum uh, if, if people are of interest with that. So at this point in time, I'm done talking about Thumb Position Book 2. It is actually a very big project. And, and I, I just do feel like it's a huge bridge between what we teach our students with their foundation and where they got to go into the highest levels of playing. And, and so it, as challenging as it is, and as much that has been crammed in there, it works, it helps. It's a necessary transition. Um, next time we meet, we're talking bow strokes. And after that, we'll all just have to be in touch with Scarlett and email and stuff and see what's going on. Is there any, anything, I mean, I already realize I'm 15 minutes over my time. Um, is there anybody with any question that they'd like to ask me at this point in time? Okay, that's fine. Yes, I have somebody, good. Yeah, um, if, if um, uh, the thumb is going from one string to other strings, uh, you, you jump a little bit and you, I, I just go and I slide. You learn your students to jump? I actually think I said this when I'm doing this thing in a demonstration. Mm -hmm. It's mostly so that you can see what's going on. I don't make them jump hard, high, okay? Sliding is fine. Sliding is fine. Or a little, a little just release. Just mm -hmm. release as we move across. Okay. Um, this big thing, I've noticed this, by the way, in case you've seen some of the other things that I've done, there are times when I'm moving my fingers too big, you know, and I'm trying to, to, to illustrate the point. And I must tell you that I don't let my students do that. Okay. I'm to show you 
um, what I'm trying to, to, to talk about. But no, you're absolutely right. I don't want excess motion. This is too much motion, especially in a fast pace. And a slide or a release uh, is all we need. And it's to me, the issue and the reason why I was doing this, the issue is the timing. Mm -hmm. I was trying to emphasize the timing when I was doing that thing. Okay, and then uh, still another question. Uh, if if you, um, uh, with the fourth finger, um, mm. the I, I tell my students, if you uh, can't um, keep your first finger, for example, on the good spot, it's not so important. If you, uh, you put your fourth finger and it's going up, then you put your first finger back on the really good uh, place. Um, do you think that that's good? Or do you say, no, don't use your fourth finger if you can't uh, keep the other fingers on the right spot? No, uh, what happens, what begins to happen as we get farther and farther up the fingerboard and the notes get closer and closer together, we can start doing some intervals and things that I would never let them do down here. Yeah. Okay. Like I would never let them do four down here like this in the lower part of the cello, like ever. Yeah. Always going to be out of tune. And that's why I make a huge deal about this. But you get up here, well, let's face it, there's time you can just stretch. I don't like the word stretch because stretch kind of implies tension, but it is. It can be just a yeah, stretch. But, but yeah. for example, if, if, if the pattern is um, a, a big step, big step, small step, and then you put your, your fourth finger and, and it's too far, you, you, you can't stay with your first finger on the good spot. I, I say, oh, go just a little bit up if you put your fourth and then go back. Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, okay. here again, one of the things I'm trying to do is establish like a system, uh -huh. recognizing that there are many, 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 many exceptions. <laughs> they come up constantly and you have to allow the needs of the music and the needs of the phrase and the needs of the moment to, to help you make the exceptions. I even talked to my students and about this, this phrase, which took me when I was young so long to understand what it even meant, the exception that proves the rule. Mm -hmm. the, by recognizing there is an exception, it sort of gives, gives credence to the fact that there's actually a rule that we are being, um, you know, uh, that we're being accepting from. So yeah, no, I, I, th those things are fine. And the, the, the thing that you seem to be describing to me actually looks really, really good because it's flexibility. It's moving as necessary with balance. Yeah. If you ask me, that's, that's the bottom line. So again, my idea is a structure, okay? Let's try and, and, and create a structure and create a way of moving around. And then let's deal with the individual situations as they occur and make our exceptions. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh, you're welcome. Anything else? Well, okay, then maybe we'll get Scarlett to come back. We'll sign off and, and, and I'll see you in two weeks with both drops. Yes, I hope so. Thank you very much, Rick, for okay. this massive, massive information. That was a lot, but very, very good and very yeah. helpful. All right, thank you. Yeah, I do hope that when people kind of see what the point is, it helps them to teach the book. And again, if you're not a teacher and if you're a student, it helps you know how to approach the pieces and what is the point behind them. And, and in, with that information, it can help you to learn things uh, more efficiently, perhaps. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Scarlett. Thank you very much. I'll see you all in two weeks. And that will be a very interactive session. So get your cello packed, unpacked. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you both. Bye-bye.